Hi, in this short video, I would like to look at an example of a perfect engine. Here, the perfect should be in quotes, because what we are going to describe would actually be an impossible engine. So let's start with an example of an engine that somebody already tried to make perfect. That would be the Carnot cycle. You have seen it before. It consists of isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, isothermal contraction, and adiabatic contraction. We keep calling this ideal, but you might wonder why. If we refer back to the results we derived, these are the heat transfers and the network done. It doesn't seem quite perfect to a lot of people for how much heat was inputted. Not all of that heat input goes to work done. And there's a lot of expelled waste heat. That is, of the heat that enters in the isothermal expansion, significant fraction of that has to live in the isothermal contraction. And that seems wasteful. To most people, when you ask them what would be the efficiency of a perfect engine, what they would say is, well, for a perfect engine, it should have perfect efficiency, or 100%. And it's on this measure, the Carnot cycle is seriously lacking in. So let's consider this question. Could we get 100% efficiency by modifying this cycle somehow? When you look at the Carnot cycle carefully, you can see where all this inefficiency is coming from. Look at how much work is done under the isothermal expansion. I'm drawing this slightly off because I'm imagining the whole adiabatic things canceling out. I'm rearranging the shape a little bit. What is causing this to be inefficient is for the contraction back. There has to be so much work done on the gas taking the heat out. And the area left between two isothermal curves will never equal the input heat, so it'll never be 100% efficient. Now, let's dream about changing this Carnot cycle that we know. Here's how I imagine a perfect engine could be built. We could try to avoid all this negative work being done, the work being done on the gas. Let me try this. So we follow the Carnot cycle from A to B, then to C, and instead of returning to D, let's say we are going to reduce the pressure all the way down to zero. Now, practically this would be very difficult, but we are imagining an ideal scenario. Let's call this point E. And now that the pressure is at zero, you can change the volume without doing any work. So there's no work being done here, just the volume changing freely. And once you are at point F, then now you can absorb heat, cause the gas to undergo isochoric heating. Now all of the pink area is the work done, nothing wasted. Now, if you look at this carefully, you have to come up with a conclusion uh, it wasn't so good. <laughs> um, in this isochoric cooling, you must expel some heat. So it's not true that there was no waste heat expelled. Then maybe you realize at this isochoric heating, there's heat entering your gas. This and must actually be the same amount of heat because you are going back up to the same isotherm. Now, if you're thinking, oh, work done is QH, so it's now 100% efficient, that's not quite right. Because with this modification, in addition to the QH, this amount of Q1 is also an input heat. So it's more like work done is QH plus Q1 minus Q1. And the efficiency actually is the work done, QH, 
divided by u different denominator qh plus q1 now you might want to treat it like but it's the same q1 don't they cancel out well um if you're thinking of the normal perfect engine um, these two q1s are different kind of oversimplifying here the q1 being released here has to go into the low temperature reservoir the one at zero kelvin <laughs> and the heat that's entering here has to come from the high temperature reservoir maybe one at tl so that's the sense in which these two heat are different they are not coming to and from the same reservoir if you really want 100% efficient engine then this is what you need instead of this heat here being released into lower temperature reservoir you need to be able to release this heat into TL then these two Q1s will now truly cancel they are truly equivalent to each other the minus Q1 here cancels out the plus Q1 here now unfortunately this process here is what is forbidden by the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics heat never spontaneously flows from low temperature to high temperature this is one illustration of why Clausius statement is equivalent to the Kelvin statement because if you could imagine he could possibly flow from low temperature to high temperature then that's all we need to make a hundred percent efficient perfect engine but that's not true so we can't make a hundred percent perfect engine instead we are going to have to be limited by the efficiency of a perfect engine that's allowed within the laws of thermodynamics that's the efficiency of the Carnot engine or taking the ratio of the work and the heat input we see there a lot of numbers cancel out you get th minus tl oh or equal to 1 minus tl over th this is the maximum possible efficiency given access to two thermal reservoirs the lowest possible temperature tl and the highest possible temperature th any other reversible cycle or irreversible cycle operating within this regime wastes some of the possible efficiency it's the Carnot cycle that makes sure that all heat input occurs along the highest possible temperature and heat output occurs along the lowest possible temperature so we are going to have to resign ourselves to that the Carnot efficiency which is never at 100% unless you have access to zero Kelvin low temperature reservoir is the most perfect engine possible we are going to soon look at the second law of thermodynamics through a different lens and in this different lens Carnot cycle will be useful again although not in such a quite unique role until then Bye.